All right, this is show number 144, and tonight we have another first. We had so many firsts, Tim, you think we'd run out of the possibility of having a first. Yeah, but, really, and this is obviously something we have not done, and I am very glad to see this. Yeah, yeah, I, I can't believe we've not done this before, um, but we have not done it. And something that one of our original listeners, I don't know how far back he goes, but he goes, he goes you know, pretty far back uh, with us. One of our original listeners, Stephen Riley, out there really early, was posting in our Facebook group. He was probably one of our first ones in a Facebook group that wasn't my family member. Um, <laughs> and, I, and, and I added my family members uh, myself. You know, so it wasn't like they, they asked to be added. Uh, but one of our first members out there, Stephen Riley, and he was been in the, in the train photography for a long time. And, you know, who doesn't love trains? I mean, I, I've always loved trains. And I came across Gene, who's our guest tonight, a while back. He's been in one of my circles for a, for a long time, more than one, actually. I think when I pulled him up earlier, he was in nine of my circles. I didn't even know I had nine circles for photographers, but apparently I do. Um, so he was in nine of my circles. And it wasn't until recently when I was watching, looking at one of his photos, and he said something about the city that he photographed it in. And I said, wait, that, that's like a city that's just two, three miles south of me. Is he passing through? And I realized, no, he lives just a little bit south of me. He's one of those crazy <laughs> things like Kathleen, who lived a, a mile from me, and I've never met her. Um, but Jean, um, I'm going to probably mess up your name, but it's fairly easy. So let's see if I can get it right. Jean Boker? Bowker. Bowker. <laughs> <laughs> Should have asked beforehand, <laughs> Mike. Should have asked. There's actually two different pronunciations of it, and Boker and Bowker are both different parts of the family. Well, I'm sorry I messed it up already. <laughs> um, but no, Gene, uh, is you, among other things, you know, I, I, I never want to put somebody in a box that it, this is the only thing I do. But among other things, you photograph um, trains and railroads. Right. And mm -hmm. I thought that would be a great topic to come on. And before we get too far into it, I know that, you know, in our Facebook group, the thing that has been the most controversial ever has been... Um, train photography, not the kind that not the kind that Gene does, and we'll maybe address that at, an, uh, at another show. But the the most controversial thing is taking photos of people on train tracks, and that's not what we're going to go over tonight. So anybody out in chat or, or listen to this later is ready to jump on me. Um, that's not what we're talking about tonight. And I don't know, Gene, if if you have any comments toward that, but I'll just say in my opinion, um, regardless of whether you think you dodge trains and all that kind of stuff. And, I'm not, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, if it's legal to do it, I wouldn't be having a client on top of there. That's probably not good for your insurance and not good if you get arrested for your business. So Right, keep, and it's really bad. And it's really bad if somebody gets hit. Absolutely. <laughs> really bad. <laughs> I got to imagine if, if somebody gets hit, that your insurance company is going to say, uh, nope, you're not covered. You're going to – that's out of pocket, buddy. Out of pocket. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, so Gene, uh, how did you get in? How did you get into um, train photography? Well, I guess it really started back when I was probably like five or six. My parents took me on Amtrak out in California between San Diego and L.A. It was like 1976. I'm dating myself, but um, after that. We always used to stop and watch trains. My dad was kind of a closet rail fan. We didn't take a lot of pictures of them, but we had a model railroad in the garage. And then over the years, as I got different kinds of cameras, starting with like a 110 even and moving up to a film 35, I always used to try to take um, photos of trains you know, when I would find them. And I have a bunch of prints still from back in the late 80s and early early 90s that I took. But then Probably I really got back into it maybe five to six years ago. Okay. Okay. Um, and what, what got you back into it? I've always enjoyed trains and enjoyed photography. And I've you know read Trains Magazine, which is the big uh, railroad magazine, and always thought, well, it'd be fun to take pictures like they do. So I just, I guess that became my thing to photograph when I would go out places is, oh, I can take pictures of trains and then that led to better digital cameras and more equipment and how it, you know, how it works for everybody. Yeah. And, you know, Tim, um, I, when I was re getting ready for this uh, a while back and, and looking at train photography, I thought, I wonder how many of our listeners, and I, I, 
and this may be sexist, so if you're female, you can fuss at me later, but I figure that probably more men would be into training photography than females. But I wondered how many, how many people are really into train photography, and that type of thing, photos of trains. Gene is a part of a group. Uh, maybe you're admin the group, over, uh, community over on uh, Google+. Plus. There's almost 11,000 members in that community wow. that's devoted to tr you know, train photography. So, the, I mean, right there, that tells you something. Uh, 11,000 members is, is nothing to sneeze at, especially since we have nothing like that. <laughs> right. and, and that actually, that was one, when Google Plus started Communities, which I guess has been about a year and a half ago, the guy that actually founded it had a railroad photo page on Google Plus, and he started one, and I started one the same day, and we decided to merge our two together. So Bob Harrison is the founder, and then I've been the moderator for two years. But yeah, we hit 10,000, I think, last year sometime. And that's all over the world, and lots of people overseas, and a lot of people you know, here in the U.S. too. Yeah, and at, at last I checked, you were like 10,800 or something. You're getting close to 11,000. Uh, so we'll have that link in our show notes too. If you're interested in joining uh, in Gene's uh, Google Plus community, you know that's a great community. You can go out there and look at the photos and and see what other uh, the discussion and join in the discussion there too. So Gene, what what uh, makes a good train photo? And I I'm think it's go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I, I'm going to start streaming some of the photos uh, of, of yours as we talk. So. That's going to be playing in the All background. Right. I guess um, to me, it's either something that's historical or it's something where you capture the action, you know, and I guess compared to it's, it's kind of like sports photography in a way, because if the trains are moving, you know, it's part of that thing is capturing those as they're moving by and trying to get that photo where it stops it just perfectly and it's in focus and, you know, you get the look that you want. And then also, it's how do you process the photo afterwards as far as going back in and, you know, I try to put my own taste on or my own touch on it, either black and white or sometimes selective color or at least the way that I process. Yeah, I, I'm looking, I've looked at some of your photos and I love the, there's a lot of them that are black and white. And you'll notice um, people who are watching it, not all of these are actual train photos, but I, I want to talk about why I picked them later on too, because uh I think that they, they interact with, with some of this, too. So, and, and also because Gene doesn't just photograph trains. He does other things, too. So I included some other items there that we can talk about. But I notice a lot of them you do black and white. Is that because, um, like, a lot of things with black and white, the black and white brings out details that maybe are lost in the color? Well, part of it is actually one of my big influences is O. Winston Link that was a railroad photographer back in the 1950s that shot black and white. And he did the nighttime photos on the, um, on the Norfolk and uh, Western and actually has a museum up in Roanoke. And then the other part of it is, is I actually have color deficiency in my vision okay. on like the browns and the greens. So sometimes what I see as a color isn't really what the color is. So I started doing a lot of black and white photography kind of to cover that. And for some reason, trains, you know, planes, automobiles, I guess, uh, look great in black and white to me. They just, it does bring out the details and it does, you know, kind of make them, some of them timeless. Yeah, you know, uh, for me at least, uh, a lot of times with trains, and there's, of course, there's modern trains, but a lot of times with trains, I think of times in the past, not, maybe not so much modern. So to me, the feel of the black and white does, does two things. It, it brings out details that... Um, may be lost with the color, but also gives it that time, that the feel of time for me. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I like that. Now, um, I, so some of these photos of these trains may be trains that the train enthusiasts would say, oh, you captured a, you know, X train. You know, Stephen, right. who's, Stephen who's watching now, when he sees these trains, I'm sure in his mind, every time one pops up, he knows exactly what that train is. But for the layman like me, I have no idea. The one we're looking at now says CSX. That's all I know. Um, right. But the, 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 the beauty that you capture in the image is what speaks to me and the, and the power. I mean, a trains, you look at a train and you see power. Well, and if you go by the tracks, and of course, you know, we'll get into staying off the railroad property and all that stuff back to earlier. But, yeah. you know, the, when, if you're 10 feet or 15 feet or 20 feet away from the track and a train comes by at 60 miles per hour, you not only you know, hear it coming and the horn coming and the you know, the bell or the 
whatever, but you feel it as it, you know, thunders by and it shakes the ground and the power, like you said, the power of the train. And I think that's part of it too. It's the same, you know, the same thing that appeals to drag racing or, you know, maybe car racing or other things like that. It's that, you know, that strength of it or the power of it. Now, uh, how do you, do you just go out by a track and just wait for one to come by? Or are you going out, I'm going to go try and catch this train because I know it's going to be coming by here at a certain time? Uh, both. Like the steam trains that are on here are ones that I knew were going to be somewhere on a particular day. Okay. Or they're at a museum. Whereas a lot of times around here, you know, it's just going to the track and knowing that, you know, the Norfolk Southern, which runs by both of our houses, you know, they run 20 to 30 trains a day through here. So... There's usually trains every at least hour or so. Okay, okay. And do you ever go out there uh, to photograph these and and you're not alone? There's other people out there photographing them too? Yeah, especially more here around Atlanta. There's quite a large, um, you know, rail fan community here in Atlanta. And there's people that once, some that work for Norfolk Norfolk Southern that, um, you know, go out and photograph. And then also just people that are fans also. There's a big place over on the other side of town. trying to remember Estelle, Mm -hmm. which is on the west side of town where, you know, on a weekend there could be 30 people there. Wow. Wow. Now you mentioned steam trains. Um, I read somewhere as I was preparing for the show, I didn't just know this off the top of my head, but it makes sense when I read it is, you know, photographing steam trains. Do you ever try and do it like on a colder day to enhance the steam that, you know, they're going to get more effect steam effect. You know, normally with mine, it's just whenever I can get out and catch one. You know, with a day to, with not being a full time professional and doing this kind of as a hobby, you yeah. know, a lot of times can I get there on the weekend? But yeah, there's some great photos in the winter, and there's some people that actually do charters of trains in the winter so that you can get those big, huge plume clouds. And you know, that's what everybody calls it the big plume cloud yeah. that you get with some steam engines that really make it, you know, look, I guess, like you would think of a typical steam train like you know, with that big, big smoke and rolling up from it and everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I, the ones I I love the ones I'm looking at one now, of the trains that are coming through fog. Mm-hmm. Um, those, you know, the lights coming on and just uh, that that foggy train image is is spectacular. I love that. Right. Uh, looking at some of them also, I noticed that they're really wide angle. Was that just how you cropped it, or was that a uh, pano shot of a still oh, no, it- of a still chain train? It's a crop to one to three. Okay. Um, and actually, I do that usually because sometimes near the tracks, the stuff that's in the foreground or the or the background of the shot or the sky might not be that interesting. Yeah. And I've tried one, and it was that first one that has the train coming through the fog was probably the first one I did in the one to three crop. And just the way that it kind of leads the train through the shot, I ended up liking that. So now I have actually on my website, there's actually a whole collection of wide railroads. I think they're called Worldwide Wide World of Railroads. And it's probably, you know, 10 or 15 of these shots over the years. And now I try to make sure when I'm shooting, especially using the DSLR, that I'm shooting in the center of the frame and leaving room at the top and the bottom so that I can crop out a, a one to three later. Okay. Okay. So um, when you come upon when you come up on the shot where you want the spot where you want to shoot, how are you choosing your your location? Because you're probably not wanting a head-on of the engine. You're probably wanting to catch some of the cars behind it and maybe even uh, find a, a spot where the, the, there's a bend in the, in, the, in the rail so you can get even more of the cars. Well, how are you are, are choosing that? Do you ever get like a, a vantage point where you're maybe up higher than the, uh, the train or anything like that? Yeah, and there's some places where there's overpasses that you can get on or, you know, where there's like a bridge or something like that. And that gives you that kind of up over the top kind of shot or the side of the hill where you're up above it. There's one in the here where the train looks really small in the yard. Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's that actually looked like a model railroad set with the little people next to it. I have that one I can pull up separately. So I'll keep you keep going. I'll right. look for it. And then usually I prefer the shot, like you said, with the train going out behind it because that kind of gives you an, more of an idea of what the train is. You know, is it a coal train or is it a passenger train with Amtrak or is it a steam train with its cars or is it a you know intermodal train with all the double stack containers? And it kind of gives it, if you're into trains, it can kind of sometimes tell you when it was made by, you know, the paint scheme of the locomotive or what kind of cars are behind it or the fact now that there's no cabooses and, you know, the things like that. Wait. There's no cabooses, period, or there's no caboose on that train? There's usually no cabooses on any trains, except if it's a local where they where they need it for the crew to work on. 
what was okay so this is going off the photography standpoint but what was the original purpose of the caboose um back in the old days when they actually had a five-man train crew yeah. the unions actually used to have five-man train crews it would be an engineer and a fireman up front the fireman actually on a steam engine was the person responsible for calling it or you know making sure that the fire was working then you had a conductor and yeah. usually two brakemen and they would be responsible for you know working when the train had to make stops and whatever and when they stopped you know having those large crews they started reducing the number of crews it went from five man crew to a four man crew and then it went to a three man crew and now most um, freight trains are two man crews you know, with just an engineer and a conductor on the train. So they mm -hmm. basically decided that they don't really need the caboose anymore. Right. They actually automated it. And if you ever watch the back of a freight train, at least in the U.S., there's a blinking red light on like a silver box. Huh. That's called a Fred or the flashing rear end device. And basically it communicates back to the engine via radio and tells them what's going on with their train. It makes sure that they know that the air pressure is there for the brakes and that the train's in one piece and it basically was a you know cost saving measure like everything else you know efficiency and cost and cost savings but if you go up to the coal fields they actually still do use cabooses on some trains because some of the branch lines can be like a backup move of several miles so they actually the conductor and even sometimes an extra train crew member will ride on the caboose and basically radio the or the engineer to tell them okay we're crossing the road now or you know, watch out for, you know, watch out for obstacles that have fallen across the tracks and things like that. Wow. That's, that's really amazing when you think about it, how big a train has become over the years and how there's less people on them. Mm -hmm. And there's some of these that are, you know, over a mile long, coal trains wow. and intermodal trains that can run, you know, 5,000, 6,000 up to even out West. There's some that they run now at like eight to 9,000 feet long. Wow. Wow, that's that's crazy. I did I did not know that the caboose went away. That's that's news to me. And I really never knew what the caboose was for. Just you know, as a it kid. was basically it was the office for the conductor. And back before computers and you know before everything was automated on the train, they actually had to fill out paperwork and they had you know ongoing basically their office back there. The brakeman set up in the little out in the windows or up above the caboose and the window above the caboose to watch for problems with the train. And basically, the conductor filled out his paperwork. And if they were in an area where there weren't good hotels or whatever, a lot of times crews were assigned to the cabooses, and they might actually live in those overnight. Basically, they'd have bunks in them, and you could actually a little stove, and you could actually basically live in your caboose for a couple of days while you're mm -hmm. out on the runs and you know out west in places where there wasn't as many hotels. Very interesting. So I, I did they, really, did they have cabooses long after the the steam engines ended, or was it a uh, Mainly, pro once steam ended, the uh, the the cabooses ended as well. It was sometime in the probably like early '90s that they started getting rid of them. Oh, really? All right, well after steam ended, then. Right, and the union was the biggest you know reason that they lasted. I think as long as they did, because there was you know there were federal laws basically stating that, and state laws that said train crews had to be a certain number of people. So uh, as those laws were you know, repealed or, you know, trains basically reduced, you know, reduced the need for those extra crew members, you know, then it became a thing of, well, we don't need the caboose. And it, you know, it became a thing that they could get rid of. Right. Okay. Um, very interesting. I'm sure Stephen knew all that stuff, but I didn't know any of that stuff. That's, that was good. Thanks, Gene. We were you talking earlier about that one that looked like a model train set, Tim. Right. And I got that one pulled up now. And, uh, yeah, that's one reason I pulled this. I knew it wasn't a model train set. Those are real people. And that's a real train. But I love the effect. How, talk to us about how you did that effect. Um, well, I shot the shot, and it's up in, it's in Williamson, West Virginia, which is up in the coal country. And it's on actually a, a U.S. highway that climbs up out of the yard. And I'd been there to photograph this train. I drove about from Aiken, um, South Carolina at the time up there, which is about an eight-hour drive, to be there for that train. And... After I, I guess the first time I posted that shot on um, Google Plus, somebody said to me, you know, hey, that really looks like a model train. And somebody suggested using miniaturization or the tilt shift mm -hmm. kind of effect. So the original one that I did had the train and you could really see the detail in the background and everything. And then I think I used, I'm not sure which, which software I used at the time, but I did a kind of a tilt shift miniatur miniaturization kind of effect on it to make it so that only part that was really in focus was the train itself. And it really did a good job of making it you know, look like a model or, 
you know, and drawing your focus to where I wanted it. Yeah, oh, no, definitely. It, I mean, that's exactly. It looks like a model train where, where you have a uh, what was it? What's that uh, that lens, the lens baby. Yeah, right. That's what it looks like. Mm-hmm. And a lens baby is another way to get that same you know kind of effect with those new. I think it's the eighty. Um, 80 millimeter one that they have that has that slit focus, uh, you know, across the, the across the um, image like that. And, and um, it looks like you were at a higher vantage point. And I think with these effects coming from a higher vantage point is it generally makes out makes the effect better. Right. They don't. I don't think they really work well on a level shot. You really need some elevation, you know, like a hillside or you know a bridge or something like that to really make the effect work like it's supposed to. Yep. Hey, by the way, somebody out in chat named Carlson says hi, Gene. Oh, hey, Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> he told me to say hi to you. Yep. He's up. Uh, he's on Google Plus. Hello, Carlson. Welcome to the show and to Gene here. Um, so this next one, I noticed it's in some of them. It looks like an HDR effect, and right. I wanted to ask you if that's what what you're doing there uh, with some of these HDR. And I, it seems like trains would be. You know, perfect for for an HDR effect because HDR, just like black and white, sometimes brings out that detail. And there's so much detail in a train. Um, on this one, it's actually I don't think any of the photos that are on the website right now are truly HDR, meaning multiple exposures. You know that I've blended okay. together. But I really heavily use the Nick software package. Um, this is actually done in color effects, um, and it's using I believe it's the revealing detail. Um, pre, which was one of the ones that actually Nick Nick software before they were bought by Google used to have like forty different presets you could play with. Yeah, and it's basically starting with that, and then you know I did some extra things to it. But yeah, you're right with the silver trains, metal trains, and things like that. It does it gives it like a car wheel on a HDR effect, and it gives it that kind of you see every detail, and it gives it that kind of look. And this one particularly that day, the sky like it was with you know the clouds and. The, like a lot of contrails going across it. It just made for a really good shot. Plus, that's the actually the Barnum and Bailey Circus train uh, when it was in Columbia, South Carolina. I guess it was in last year, and that's you know what they travel still around the country in trains. They they have two different trains that travel the country all year, and they're about eighty cars each. Yeah, you know, there's elephants actually on the trains. Wow. They have elephant yeah. cars still. The, all the crew lives in the trains. They're based down in Florida. Uh, but you know, it's, it's really something and there's actually websites that track where those trains are every day. So you can go to that website. It says, Hey, the train's going to be here. You know, you can say, Oh, it's going to be coming by our house. You know, at this time of day, we think, you know, they're never specific, but you know, you at least know that it should come by at a certain time. Like this one, they were doing shows. So the trains parked off in the yard and this is actually from a public highway or public dirt road that drive that goes right beside the yard and gave me the chance to get out there and get some photos of it. Does that mean that they have to set up tent and set up shop near um, the train track somewhere, everywhere to go? Well, not really. They can, They actually they have trucks on trailers that are behind it and buses okay. that they carry with them. So they'll actually, you know, they'll stop a lot of times somewhere near the arena if there's a, you know, like when they play Atlanta, it's at the Phillips Arena the first time. Yeah. You know, the train track go right by there. So they can unload basically out front. But, you know, when they play here in Gwinnett, you know, they're still basically parked somewhere down in Atlanta and they're just trucking their equipment. You know, they can they can deal with it. There's also a smaller barn in Bailey's that's completely truck based now. You know, I, I guess with a, a train, I mean, you could just about bring everything you wanted. The elephants, your trailers. I mean, uh, that's that sounds like a great way to uh, move your circus around the country. Any other way would just be about, uh, you know, economically impossible, I'd imagine. Yeah, and that's in the amount of equipment they can haul on these trains, you know, is pretty amazing. Plus for the crew members, you know, you basically if you if you ever see there's a there was a train call or a show called Extreme Trains that was on Discovery a couple of years ago, I think mm-hmm. it was. And one of the episodes covered the circus train and they showed their little apartments that, you know, the different people on the in the show actually have and they have small apartments, you know, on these trains. So if you're gonna be on it for nine months, you know, you can have your own stuff and it's basically like going back to your own you know, very small trailer compared to a hotel room every night. Yeah. Um, okay. Steven had some questions he sent to me and I want to get to him before I forget. And uh, you covered it a little bit, but I wanted to to touch on this again is 
what are some of your favorite editing techniques? And uh, this is coming from Stephen Riley, who's out in chat. I, I guess probably for me, um, the favorite thing is one is that crop, you know, the one to three crop. I use that quite a bit or I'll use square, which is, you know, the one to one ratio. And it's all in, it's usually in cropping. You know, it's not like I'm actually making with an old film camera or something like that. But to me, it helps emphasize, you know, either the length of the train or it kind of the square, like on the front of some of the shots where you can see the front of the train. And then for processing, you know, I'm using, like I said, the Nick software suite with uh, color effects. And then I love silver effects. And then their new one, which is analog effects, mm -hmm. is actually is actually has some pretty neat techniques in it also that you can use or tools that you can use now to edit the photos. And then a lot of it's in Lightroom. There's sometimes, you know, the shot's nothing more than bringing it home, you know, basically playing around with the clarity and bringing up some of the shadows depending on the time of day. You know, a lot of these shots are made during the middle of the day just because that's by the time I get somewhere. You know, it's not one of these things that you have to be there at sunrise or you have to be there at sunset. You know, you can really take a photo any time of the day these days and still get a reusable photo out of it. Right, right. Uh, I, you know, the last one, the analog effects, or whatever one you said there, I have I have Nick and I have Topaz Labs, and I don't use either one of them near as much as I should because so I'm not an expert in any of them. I do most of my Lightroom, but... Um, I think when I got the night the Nick set, it did not include that analog one you just mentioned. What does it? What does that do? Uh, analog effects, and it's part of the new package. It actually should be in there if you have the one from Google now. Uh, basically, it can replicate old camera types. It's not specific as to which one it's replicating, kind of like it is in some of the other programs. But okay. you can say that it looks like a you know kind of like an old film camera, or it looks like an old rangefinder kind of effect that you would get. Plus. One of the things they do is they do a lot of, um, I guess, deterioration or however you want to put it, where, you know, you can do add streaking like it would have been a wet plate. You can add um, corrosion like it would have been um, basically, you know, a photo that you happen to leave somewhere and, you know, got wet or, you know, different kinds of effects. You know, more, not so much on the train photos, but particularly on the Americana photos. Some of those work pretty well to, um, you know, to kind of give you some different effects. It's also pretty good to use to make a um, border, just to give you like a plain black border or a film looking border that looks like a 35 millimeter film strip or a, you know, like some of the old, you know, some of the old four by fours and things like that. Yeah. And I bought my Nick before uh, Google bought them. So, mm -hmm. and I don't know if I have to rebuy everything or, or if I get oh, some no. kind of discount, but I need you to look actually at that. Get it for free. If really? You have the email, if you have the same email address that you did uh, when you bought it from the company before they bought it. Um, just download the free trial, which I recommend that to everybody. If you've never played with it, go to, you know, Nick software and, you know, download the free trial. It includes the whole suite. You know, there's an HDR program. That's pretty good. There's color effects, silver effects, 15 day free trial, you know, which is great. If you don't like it, just mm -hmm. don't pay for it. But if you no contact their customer service with your email that you used when you bought the original one and your serial number from your original one, from any of the programs, any of the separate modules, you mm -hmm. get the whole package now for um, for free. Awesome. And, yeah, I need to do that. Have, yeah, and if you have to buy the package, I think it's $149 now, but they run it on sale every once in a while. Yeah, I definitely still have all that information because I, I keep all that. I keep every email I got. I got a crap load of email. Um, so Carson, I think earlier you were talking about a website and Carson posted out in chat uh, called Heritage Units, maybe, heritageunits.com. Yep, that's the website where you can track all of the um, special locomotives and the circus trains and, and all that stuff. You can track where they're at in the country and... Uh, and basically, people it's kind of like people report in. So if you're one of the people that belong to the site, and I think there's 20,000 or more members now, if you see one of these locomotives somewhere or know where it's at, you basically post a spotting or however you want to put it, and basically they it, that tells us where the locomotives are. Okay. It's not official information from the railroads. Yeah. It's basically from people seeing them along the way or knowing where they're going. And there's a lot of rail fans that work for the railroads. So sometimes, you know, you do get a little bit of insider information, but normally it's, you know, people out, you know, you see the locomotive go by and you say, oh, okay, I'll go to heritage units. They have a, I think they have an Android and an iPhone app now where you can, you know, put that information in and it's you know, pretty easy to use. And it, it helps if you're looking for a particular locomotive. Yeah, I imagine it, they don't want to publish it themselves for security reasons. They don't want to publish that. And this is um, more about where it's at, right? 
not like a GPS tracking. Right. Well, and it's funny though because the Union Pacific Railroad actually has live steam still, or you know, steam locomotives that go around the country all the time. And there's a big thing right now about they're going to restore a third locomotive, and they've been it's been coming across the country from Los Angeles to Cheyenne where they do their work. Mm-hmm. Their locomotives actually have GPS on board, and they have Twitter accounts. And when they're on the rails, you can actually follow their Twitter their Twitter feed, and every mile it basically pings where they are with a GPS location. Awesome. So with and, those locomotives, you can you can know exactly where it is. You know, you can help plan for a photo, or you know, you can track where if you even if you're at work or whatever, you can kind of watch where it's going across the country, following that. I'm looking at a uh, a big boy right now. That, that's yep. probably my favorite train, and uh, it's out in Cheyenne, it's out in Wyoming, yep, uh, Utah. Yeah. I need well, to get and, out west. And, and Carlson just says out in chat that you can set up an alert. So you, whenever something's coming to your area, I imagine you get an alert saying that it's in your area or coming to your area. I'm pretty sure I won't be finding any big boys up here in New York. <laughs> Not for a while. Whenever they <laughs> whenever they get the engine restored, they're planning on taking it to different parts of the country, but there's actually restrictions because of the weight of it on where it All can right. run. Okay. Stevens, so let's uh, continue in Stevens' questions. Uh, Steven asked, what is your view on popular railroad photography site railpictures.net and their guidelines on how to get images accepted into the database? And I'll be honest, I have no idea about this website, so uh, I, I, I'm just reading what's here. I don't, I don't know anything about this. Um, I've actually never posted anything there myself, but it's basically a photo. It's like Flickr for rail fans. It's the easiest way to explain it. Okay. But they actually have curators or I guess moderators, however you want to put that. And you actually have to submit the photo. Somebody physically looks at the photo and decides whether or not it is acceptable. And over, I guess, you know, it's one of those things that over a period of time, certain people's photos are always acceptable and other people's photos never seem to be. And, you know, but with them, they're looking for photos that are different and they're looking for something that's unique, you know, because if it's say one of those steam trains, there might be a hundred people photographing it that day. Mm -hmm. Uh, So they have a lot to choose from. But if you see something really unique along the, you know, on a train or something like that, you have a really good chance. You know, if it's a good quality shot, you know, they have specific guidelines, but it has to be in focus. You know, it needs to be, you know, exposure wise. They're not a big fan of, uh, a lot of post-processing on their shots. You know, they're basically, it's back to the old school of, you know, it was he- it was here, I got a photograph of it. So they're not really big fans of post-processing. But it was, you know, it's never been, I have my, since I have my own website, it's never been someplace that I really, you know, tried to put a lot of my photos. And speaking of your, your website, uh, we showed it earlier on, but I didn't say the address. And that is, and we'll have it in the show notes in case uh, you've, don't get this, but it's rustedrailimages.com. Right. right. Yeah, and we'll show that here in a little bit. Um, so uh, going down my list of questions, and if you guys out in chat have any questions, you know, put them in chat, and, and I'll work them into the show. But, um, you know, look at your images. They're not always of the train. They're of the surrounding area. And for me, I pick some of these, and some of these are obvious, like the one I'm going to show right now, you know, railroad crossing. Um but some of them are of the, the surrounding areas, and I think I could pick a couple just because I really liked it. I mean, I had anything to do with trains. Um, but some of them are a surrounding area, and I kind of get – they all have that same feel of what I, how I feel of a railroad, um, that, that timelessness of the, a railroad. So how do you – when you're out there shooting, do you go out shooting for the, the train and just while you're there go, ooh, that sign looks interesting. Let me take you to that picture. Or do you um, go out specifically looking for certain shots? Of these of these sites it's probably a combination of both um you know around here it tends to be sometimes i'll shoot things along the railroad because i'm there and i'm waiting for a train to come by but um if i go somewhere you know like we we traveled up to west virginia last year and there's old coaling towers you know where the where the train where the steam trains used to take coal and be you know have the the coal loaded into them and a lot of that stuff is just historical. Or if you're at a museum, you know, there's a great museum here in Duluth, which I haven't been to yet, sadly, after a year. But uh, there's a big one at Virginia Museum of Transportation up in Roanoke that some of the photos are, were taken at. You know, if you're there, to me, it's about the details on the locomotives and the and kind of the whole, you know, bridges. And, 
you know, things like the signage along the railroad or, you know, the little buildings that used to be there. And if you ever see old photographs along a railroad, there used to be a lot more buildings and a lot more signs and, you know, a lot more people employed by the railroads than there are today. So if you find those kind of things, it's always great to get a photograph of it. You know, one of the things that's kind of happened with railroads as much as anything else is standardization. You know, and as they add more and more technology, all the railroads are starting to look more and more alike, as particularly along their tracks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there was one, uh, and I got a bridge up now, and I love this black and white of this bridge. There was one of your shots I didn't pick. Um, and, and by the way, the images you're seeing that we're streaming now are all reduced quality. They're not going to be, you know, as good as you'll see on his site. So be sure to go out to Gene's site, rusted, rustedrailimages.com, and look at them. And they're full quality out there. And you also have a bunch posted on Google+. Plus. But even the quality I can see here, I love looking at this, um, at this train. But I was saying, I got off track. I, I, one of the ones I didn't pick was of a, I think it was a train yard that had a very modern looking, uh, I don't know what it really was, but maybe like a train hub uh, center, where I like the ones more like this one, where it looked like a, an old train, what do you call that? Uh, depot. Depot, yeah, an old train depot, that kind of thing. It, it had much more of that, that timeless feel that I keep talking about. Mm-hmm. And like that one is actually, there's no train tracks left at that depot. It's up near <laughs> Athens, Georgia, a couple hours or an hour and a half from here in a little town called Winterville. And the trains used to go by there, but I think they abandoned the tracks through there probably, you know, maybe in the 60s or 70s. But the community, you know, wanted the depot to you know, remain instead of being torn down. And they use it as a community center now, and they've done a good job of making it look like it would have back around. I think that one's set in like the 1920s of how it would have looked about 1920 or so. Yeah, and, you know, one of the things that's frustrating for me is uh, you live right close to me and you're getting all these great shots and I don't have anything like any of these. <laughs> <laughs> I always think, ah, these people get good shots because they live in interesting places. And then and then Gene comes along. Um, in your backyard. Yeah, literally. So uh, uh, I'll point one out now. So th- this this one here, this one here of this of this train, uh, you wouldn't, the thing that tells it for me, and Gene, of course, knows where he took it, but for me, that red caboose that's right there, I know exactly where that is. That's downtown Swanee. Um, I've, been, I've been to that location, and my shot doesn't look anything like that. And, you know, and it's one of the things that that caboose, you know, it's there and it's in the little community, and they have a cute little sign that they built above it that's, um, you know, made out of metal and everything right. says Swanee. And, you know, they've done a good job of restoring the caboose. And, you know, when you find those kind of things, part of the fun for me is how can I incorporate that into a shot yeah. so that somebody like you looks at it and goes, oh, that's downtown, you know, Swanee. That's great. You know, a lot of times with trains and particularly in the southeast where there's so much, you know, tree growth and everything, if you don't know where it is, it could be basically anywhere in Georgia or anywhere in Florida or anywhere in South Carolina. But, you know, if you find these kind of locations or there's, you know, sometimes you see great pictures of the downtown Atlanta skyline right. uh, behind the trains, things like that. You know, it puts them into a, a particular location instead of just being a train on the track somewhere. Well, what I also like about the picture is you got the caboose, which is obviously out of commission or off to the side. And you got this new train coming with, uh, I'm guessing it's intermodal, with uh, double trailers uh, stacked all the way down it. Right. So you kind of got the old and the new. And then the the other thing in this photo is there's behind that wooden thing in the center of it, there's something that kind of looks like it's made out of, or it is made out of steel. But that's a new signal bridge for their um, signals along the tracks. I was going to say, it looks like a sign like that they would put over a highway. But, yeah, that makes sense. They're going to put a new signal bridge over it. Right. And part of the thing, and I don't remember if you don't remembered it or not, but a few years ago, they had the Metro Link crash out in Los Angeles where the conductor was, I guess, or the engineer was texting and caused a train crash of the commuter of the commuter line. Yes, yes, yes. Um, after that, Congress and the America or the Federal Railroad Administration passed a thing called positive train control, which is basically a law that says that railroads that haul passengers particularly have to retrofit their lines to basically put in new digital signals and also basically controls on the trains to where they could be remotely stopped. Um, and this new signal bridge that they're getting ready to put up near Swanee, and I think it's actually about a mile from where that's sitting right then. Mm-hmm. Uh, those are actually going to replace some iron bridges that are still here in Duluth. And I have a couple of photos of the ones around Duluth, you know, that have been here since probably, you know, the 1920s or the 1930s. 
before the you know the Norfolk Southern and it, when it was still the Southern Railway. And one of the things has been for years is by the signals along the tracks, people that knew railroads could say, "Oh, that's a Santa Fe track," or "Oh, that's a Southern Pacific track," or "Oh, that's a Southern Railway track." But with these new signals, it's really going to become just, "Oh, it's you know." it's a railroad track and until you see a train and you know, sometimes trains from other railroads come through. So it's not always that easy to say, Oh, just because there's a Norfolk Southern engine on it, I'm really on a Norfolk Southern track. Okay. What, and, and Lauren out in chat and I don't, I didn't see her earlier, so maybe she's catching us a little late. Lauren, I'm recording it just for you. Uh, so you can catch the whole thing later. Uh, Lauren asked, what is your favorite, what is your favorite train that you've taken a picture of so far? I think probably the steam locomotive that was up there in um, Williamson. And just because it was in the coal fields, it was a steam engine I'd never seen before, the nickel plate 765. It's the one in that one there. And um, also the one coming through the flood wall. And it was just something about, you know, the first thing in the morning when I got there, that was probably like at seven o'clock before all the people showed up and a lot of the photographers showed up. So it was kind of like it would have been maybe, you know, years ago with, you know, the train in that town. And, they had, you know, it was basically running through the coal fields of, you know, West Virginia where there's these narrow little valleys where there's just room for that train and the highway. You know, it's not like it is out west or something where there's, you know, miles and miles of open space. These are tight little places, and it allows you as a photographer to get close to the trains without trespassing. And also, like I before, a steam engine in steam is one of these things where it's just, you know, it's alive. You know, you yeah. if you're next yeah. to it it pops and if you ever get a chance even at you know Knott's Berry Farm or Disneyland run steam engines you know go and stand next to one of the engines and just listen to it and you know you can feel the heat coming out of it you can hear the steam popping and you can hear um you know all of that you know I guess the lot how it breathes and how it kind of lives That's but a- you know that that day was great you know I, I shot at a couple of locations I shot there in Williamson and then I shot at uh, Matewan which is um, the next county over and that's the one where it comes through the flood wall. And I think I use that as the actually as Transport Tuesday on Google Plus is, um, is their theme logo, is their theme um, photograph that we use for there. And it's the same train the same day. You know, you, you get those chances that, you know, to still see something that hasn't ran in day to day service. That's, yeah, that's the other photo from that day. Dang, I, and, got, I got the right ones picked. <laughs> yep. As I say, you did good. But that's, you know, same same train on its way back towards Williamson. And it, and it comes through this little, you know, through the flood wall, which they built because this town up there would flood every year because of the rain and, and like I said, the narrow little flowery. So they built this huge flood wall around the city or, well, the town. It's about a couple hundred people. And that's the train coming out of that. And, you know, just the concrete then with this, you know, with the big train. And, you know, you don't really realize the size of these things until you get up right next to one. And, they're just, you know, it's just huge. So. I'd say probably that's my favorite as far as train special train that I've you know photographed. That's a great way to describe it too that it's alive. That you know you do have that feel because with the other trains they don't have the smoke coming out. It's just like uh, you know it's it's still impressive, but these with the smoke coming out and the popping and all the sounds you just talked about that does give it a feel of it being alive. Well, I gotta agree. I was down in a Disney Disney World last year and me and my son we did the uh, behind the steam tour. And oh, he got wow. to, got right up on the trains, and he got into the cab, and uh, it was amazing. They showed everything about the steam train, all the trains they have there, the amount of work that has to go into a steam engine, which is really what why uh, the diesel electrics really pushed them to the side. And uh, the the parts are just so hard to replace. Pretty much everything has to be manufactured by hand individually for every train when something goes wrong. But being alive, absolutely, the sounds these trains make and the rumble you feel from it is just amazing. And I'm glad to see some places still keep this alive. Uh, I mean, I'm hoping that when I retire, I can find a train, uh, a steam train that I can kind of go on, like a vac- make it part of a vacation to take a tour on, because that is something I really would love to do. Have you There's, done? Have you done that, uh, Gene? Have you rode on one as a part of a vacation? Not really. Not on like a. Not like well, not Sperry Farm. And then when I was younger, my uh, mom and I actually rode the Combrays and Toltec, which is up in um, Colorado, and like the Durango and Silverton's the other one that a lot of people have always heard of that are up there, which are kind of like they're narrow gauge, so they're even smaller trains than these. But there's a actually a place that uh, out called the Nevada Northern um, Railway, and it's out in Eli, Nevada, which is near Reno, is probably the closest city. 
But basically, they have a thing out there where it's about a 40-mile-long railroad that's basically a living history museum. And they actually do – they call it Railroad Camp. And if you look them up on the web, and I'll, I'll add a link to my web page to them, you, know, you can actually go there for a week, and they'll teach you how to become an engineer. They'll teach you how to lay track. They'll teach you how to – you know all the things that went into making a steam railroad or a diesel railroad work. And they have it all the way from like kid level, you know, like for your teenagers or younger kids all the way up until, you know, people that are you know our age or whatever, go there for their vacation. And then they do a lot of the photo charters also there. And, you know, it's wide open spaces with nothing modern. So it looks, you know, it easily could be, you know, 40 or 50 years ago. Oh, that, that's something that I hope they have in 15 years when I retire. Yeah. Yep. I mean, I actually looked up, or I, I don't know if that was specifically what I looked up, but I, I did hear of that, and that is definitely something I would want to do. What was well, uh, Tim, did you get the link there? No, I didn't get it. Uh, what was the, do you remember the link again, Jen? Gene? It's uh, Nevada Northern. Okay. It's the name of the railroad, and I don't remember how they how it's spelled oh, okay. out, but I'll, I'll find it. Okay, okay. Because I like to include it in the show notes. So that was your that was your um, favorite chain you have photographed. Is there something that you that's still elusive that you would love to get? I just put the link in that 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 link is amazing. Just just looking at it, nnry.com. Nevada Northern Railway, a national historic landmark. What? Oh. oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Um, what would what is something that you, what is a train that you would love to get someday? I think now that I'm photographing with a lot better equipment and actually have you know matured as a railroad photographer quite a bit, I would love to go out west and you know photograph the trains like in Arizona again and you know and the places that I grew up, you know, Tehachapi Loop and Home Pass and the places out in California that you know I visited 30 years ago now. Um, I'd love to get to go back out there. You know, there's some of those places that have a hundred trains a day, you know, so you're basically seeing a train every couple of minutes going by there. You know, there's lots of big wide open spaces, places that you can, you know, easily go and photograph a train, you know, for days, you know, and you could actually, you know, route 66. So you could add in Americana, you know, shots that I love and the trains, you know, the grand Canyon, you know, all the, all the stuff out West, I think would probably be, the stuff I'd love to do again that I've, you know, I haven't done in 20 or 30 years now. Yeah. Yeah. I had, I have not been out West, uh, not for trains, but for any reason for gosh, since before high school. So it's, we were talking earlier about how long it's been since we've been in high school. Uh, mm -hmm. so for a long time, I'd look, and now my kids this Friday, my, my oldest kid graduated from high school. So taking family trips out West, you know, that kind of lost that. Um, okay. So, I think somebody asked out there, are you on Instagram? If I no, I'm that. not. Do you have that's like the, I think that's the one social network that I'm not on. You're on Google+. Plus. You're on Twitter. You're on Facebook. We'll have all those links. Right. Um, I don't know what else, but you're on all those. So there's, and you're in our Facebook group. Uh, right. so, so there's there's plenty of ways to get in touch with Gene uh, yeah, there. The newest one that it, I'm actually trying to get started with and, and trying to use, because there's a lot of trained people on there, is Tumblr. And I did a um, rusted rail rusted rail um, images at tumblr.com. I think it's the link that I'm using there now. Um, there's lots of trained photography from all over the world there, and you know, part of it's people shooting their own stuff. Part of it's people, you know, sharing great images from over the years. And you know, that's one of the things that's great about railroad photography is you know, there's a whole history of this going back, you know, all the way to the Civil War. You know, here in Atlanta you'll see Matthew Brady photos of, you know, downtown Atlanta after Sherman came through and there's the old steam engines, you know, in the general in Kennesaw and, you know, in the Texas that, you know, by the zoo and things like that. So you have that history starting then. And then you have photographers, you know, that built on that over the years and particularly, you know, starting in the twenties and the thirties, you know, trains magazine's been around 70, 80 years now, you know, and if you go back, they have all their issues on a, um, you know, a DVD or a CD or DVD set now. You, know, you can go back to some of those early shots, you know, back in the 1930s. And it's great when you read those old articles or see those old ads to see how it was then and people talking about it as current. Yeah. You know, they're taking photos of something current, you know, and they got a great new camera. And you look at what it is. And like <laughs> one of the guys that shot, the, I watched lots of train videos too. And, you know, one of the guys that shot in the 1950s was using a Bell and Howard 16 millimeter camera and it had the three lens turret on the front of it. And on the video, they're talking about the fact that there's no zoom photography 
or you know no zoom images because you know you couldn't get that on a camera that a, you know a normal person would use you know you had a turret with like three different lenses you know a wide angle maybe a medium shot and then some sort of telephoto you know the you had the windings you know so you, like every you know every scene is only you know maybe 20 seconds long or whatever the winding of their film was you know and you don't get the things like you do now of you know an hour long of the same train going by or things like that yeah, you know, I, you w often wonder, and I've wondered this as I was growing up, is whatever you're, whatever time you're in, you think, wow, look at the technology that we have today. You know, the, the guys 10, 15 years ago, 20 years ago were so ancient. And, you, you know, you're looking back on those guys who were shooting with those cameras and you think, wow, they, they thought that was good stuff back then. What's it going to be like, uh, you know, 20, 30 years from now? It's just, it's just crazy. But speaking of gear... That wasn't, I was just kind of making a statement, not a question. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of gear, what do you have a favorite lens? Uh, do you like to, a wide angle or a zoom lens? Or um... Well, uh, actually, you know, one of the things that I founded on Google Plus is the Canon Users Group, which okay. is on there, which is, you know, we have 70, we're talking about 10,000 people in the railroad one. That one's almost 80,000 people. Wow. And it's not, you know, it's not sponsored by Canon or anything. It's just people that love Canon equipment. You know, and right now I shoot, most of my shots are, you know, with a 5D Mark III. Uh, my favorite lens is the 7200 wow. f 2.8 with the with the you know, stabilization on it. You know, with railroad photography, if the train's dead, sitting still, it's not that hard. You know, you can take plenty of photos of it. But when you have a train coming at you at you know 60 miles per hour, a lot of times you don't have a lot of notice that it's going to get there. You know, I'm just popping up, you know, grabbing the camera, you know, getting out of the out of the truck and trying to get a shot. You know, that the IS setting on there. You know, I, I use TV mode. You know, one of the people, one of the things all the people always ask me, well, what are you shooting in? I'm like, I'm always shooting in TV mode. And depending on how the, you know, it's those, the old demonstrations before about, you know, if it's coming straight across your frame, how, you know, how fast does the shot have to be? Or if it's coming head on, how fast does it have to be? You know, I'm shooting at the, usually the one, the three, one, three, 20, one, 500, you know, in that range to try to stop the action. And then, you know, the big thing with the DSLRs is the frames per second. Because, you know, a lot of times I use the I just use the center point focus, you know, put it right on the nose of the locomotive and then let it fire, you know, 10 shots or whatever, because I know out of those 10 shots, I'm going to probably get one or two that are keepers, you know, and I delete the rest. And then my day to day camera is actually uh, Canon G1X, which is the little compact, mm -hmm. uh, their compact pro, you know, power shot. And I love it because it shoots raw also. And it's real, it's small enough. I can carry it for business travel or I can carry it you know, back and forth during the day. And, you know, I cross the railroad tracks when I come home. You know, I'm always looking as I'm going over the bridge and saying, hey, there's a headlight coming. And, you know, and it's a, a chance. And some of these shots that are on the website, you know, or when I'm on these trips, like the one that's up now is one when I was in Arkansas to visit my mom. And, you know, it was the train tracks, you know, near where she lives and, you know, or the train tracks here around Atlanta or whatever. It's just that ability just to grab a quick shot. But, you know, normally it's the 7200 is the go-to lens. I use an older 20 to 35, mm -hmm. which I picked up, which is kind of my wide angle lens. Um, there's some of the shots where you can really tell that the train's been kind of stretched out because of the lens. And yeah. a lot of times those, and a lot of times that's what those are. That's what I was going to ask you. If you're getting a distortion when you use a wider angle lens, like this image we have up here, and I know you shoot with the 70 to 200 and I have the Nikon version of that. Love that. That's like the, the, the if all my lenses, the one I use the most. Um, right. but you, you're obviously you can't, you're not shooting a 2.8. You must be stopping this thing down some to, cause it looks like you got good depth of field here. Right. And actually that was with the G one X. Okay. So, um, it was on, I think on that one, you know, I said it when I'm using it, I run it at F 500 if I, if the train's moving and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know that one was sitting still. So it wasn't too hard to okay. um, stop, <laughs> but, um, he was parked on the siding at the time, but, um, you know, but even with a you know even with a moving train and a compact camera, you know, with the right settings, you can still you know you can stop the action. You can, uh, you know, you can get a good crisp shot. You know, a lot of times I'm not worried about what the train looks like past the locomotives. You know, I want the locomotive to be crisp. I want the front engine to be mm -hmm. crisp. And I want you to know what kind of train it was. But you know, if it's a coal train, as long as you can tell it's a coal train, I really. I guess I'm not as much of a pixel peeper or whatever. I really don't care if the rest of the train's in focus or not. I want you to know what kind of train it is, but I kind of want it to go out of focus as you go down the image sure. so that it brings you back to the locomotive.
Yeah, and I can't tell from the small little thing I'm looking at here. I, I mean, it definitely doesn't go. You have depth of field past the engine, but I, you know, further back, I'm sure it does get uh, out of focus there. But to me, the, there's several like this. Um, I, I, I just, I'm looking at a few of them that I have here, but this one kind of does it for me. Is you know, the engine itself looks so powerful by itself, but when you see the thing that it's pulling. And it goes right. goes beyond the frame, so you know this thing has got to be at least beyond the frame a little bit. Um, that just again speaks to the the massive power of these things that you're capturing this way. Right, and you know, and I think that's you know part of it is if you're a kid and you get into trains when you're a kid, you know, it's that whole powerful thing that you go out by the railroad and you see the full size trains, and then like a lot of us, you know, we're talking about before the show actually started about model railroads, yeah. you know, and things like that. And, you know, and one of the things these days is, you know, even if you don't have room for a model railroad, you know, there's a lot of computer software out there too, the train simulator programs and, you know, Microsoft had one for years and, you know, there's still train simulators where you can actually be the engineer, you know, you can, you know, it's cool. just like being inside the train, you know, it, and they have different, you know, they have like the route between San Diego and Los Angeles where I grew up, you know, I could go on there and, you know, after a hard day at work or whatever, you can go in there and play like you're the engineer and, you know, if, if you want to run the train at 150 miles per hour until it jumps the rails, you can and not have to worry yeah. about it. Now, speaking of uh, one of the things I did as a kid with my train sets is I would always want to see how much it could pull. So I would always mm -hmm. set up a piece of straight track as much as I had and put keep adding weights to it till it couldn't pull it. Did you guys do that too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then that, and then the other thing is, is I remember we had those little plastic cows. Yeah. The little... And and I would always like to see if the um, cow catchers actually worked on the little. <laughs> the, the well, I know. What, so I did the same thing. What would always happen to me I is the legs, the legs of the cow would get stuck in the track, and that would make me jump off the track. That's I don't right. know what happened to you, but that's what happened to me. Um, Lauren asked, uh, "What do you think of Folkestone, Georgia? Is that a?" Oh, it, yeah, that's one of my actual favorite places, and uh, the train in the fog is there at Folkestone. And basically, um, if you don't know, Folkestone's about an hour north of Jacksonville. And it's the kind of where all the lines from the northeast and from Atlanta and everything, they all funnel together. And talk about a town that actually loves people that take pictures of trains. They have, you know, they have a platform there with, uh, you know, with fans blowing. They have radios that, you know, broadcast what trains are coming by, the scanners, you know, like a police scanner kind of idea. Um, the trains are about, you know, 20 to 30 feet away from you. When you're standing there, uh, wow. you know, there's on a weekend, there could be 30, 40 people every April and December. We actually have what's called the rail watch, which is, you know, an, a, you know, an organized kind of thing where people that have been getting together now for about 10 years, we all show up. And, you know, this year, I think we had like 350 to 400 people there in April. You know, the winter one might have 100, 150 people. But, you know, you have 40 trains a day coming about 30 feet, you know, 30 feet away from you. You know, lots of rail fans from all over the country. We had, I think the farthest this year was Ohio and Texas. We had people there. And then we've had people from Germany before. And we've had people from, you know, overseas that are here in the U.S. that come to these events. And, you know, it it's as much, you know, the people that you know that you've met. And, you know, a lot of these people I knew on Facebook through the different Facebook groups. Or, you know, there's a few people on Google Plus now that, you know, I've become friends with that I've met at the events like that. And, you know, we do photo walks here, actually, in the Atlanta area. We mm -hmm. did the one that you're talking about earlier at Oakland. And, you know, we, we did one in Duluth last year for the um, Scott Kelby um, photo walk. Photo, yeah. the worldwide photo walk in uh, October. And, you know, it's, it's fun getting to meet some of the people that you know online and, you know, doing and, you know, doing those kind of events. And I looked at your, your Oakland Cemetery. You had a great turnout there. Yeah. Yeah. That was a great turnout. That was uh, that was very good. So we're actually coming up on the hour. And I know I told you we keep it an hour. I cannot believe that the time just flew by. Yeah, that this. flew by today again. Yeah. So, uh, you know, Gene, just a fascinating subject. Um, you know, I, I'm speaking for myself, but I love trains. I love the, the images that you've taken of train photography. I visit your I don't have anything to post myself, but I visit your your Google Plus uh, community often. And there's sure. uh, quite a few good people got to quite a few good photographers out there shooting. Yep. Uh, Steven, if you're not a member of that, out in, if you're still out there in chat, if you're not a member of that, check it out on Google Plus, and, and you may want to consider joining that. There's a, there's a lot of great photos being posted over there. Um, so, Gene, we'll have to stay in touch. And, I, you know, I still had a list of questions there, but I don't want to run too far past. I do have a couple of things to, to wrap up on here. Um, but thank you for coming. If you hang out just for a little bit longer, and then we'll go ahead and close the show. 
So things I forgot to mention at the front end of the show was to thank Aaron Sh- Shutt. I think it's S-H-U-T-T, Shutt. Real close to saying a bad word, but I think that's how you say it. <laughs> uh, for hooking us up with Jeff Troutman, who is doing the intro and exit music we use in the final thing. I need to say that more often because we, we are using that. And he gave it to us royalty-free. and didn't ask for anything in return, but I want to mention him every once in a while. Thank you, Jeff and Aaron, for that music. Um, I mentioned last week or whenever it was that a TiVo subscriber reached out to me, and I can't remember if I had his name, Tim, but I do have it now. His name is Stephen <laughs> Steven, oh, gosh, Steven Simek, S-I-M-E-K. I should share these names with you beforehand so you can correct me when I say them wrong. That's I'm an account- what I would have said. I'm an accountant. I don't know English. <laughs> <laughs> very well. <laughs> Steven you know Sy- numbers. Yeah, Steven Simak. Yeah, I had mentioned many times, if you get us through TiVo or through any odd odd place, and I say odd, I get it through TiVo too, so that's not necessarily odd. But if, you, if you're coming to us from wherever in the world or if you're getting us through whatever method to email us, and I specifically mentioned TiVo, and Steven reached out to me and said, hey, he's, he's watching it. And I got an email from today again saying that not only has he watched the show, but he often has two buddies come over and they watch it together, Tim. Now, that is really cool. And a show like today with the trains, they're going to absolutely have a great time with it. Yeah. So he had asked if we're going to continue doing it with, with TiVo, and I have no plans to stop it. And, you know, if TiVo stopped it somehow, then maybe, you know, that would happen. But no plans to stop doing that. Uh, so we'll continue with that. If you're uh, not a member of our Facebook group, like Gene is, Gene is a member of our Facebook group. And he posts some photos out there every once in a while. If you're not a member, come over to facebook.com slash groups slash JPEG to Raw. Just go to Facebook and sh- search for JPEG to Raw. If you don't like Facebook, if you're anti-Facebook, we have a community over on uh, Google+. Plus, Not anywhere near the size of jeans, but we do have a community <laughs> over there. And then we also have amazing forums. There's not a whole lot of posting going on. Again, it's, it's mainly me. But they're much improved from our old days of the forums. They're, they're really nice, Tim. You should go out there more often. Um, yeah, more often. <laughs> they're really nice, uh, allowing easier posting of images and a lot better interaction. So, and, and I'm posting stuff out there, like I just posted recently, about how I am. I plan for for storage. You know, uh, if I'm getting low on storage, I want to make sure that. I don't come home one day with my images and download a card and find out that I have no more hard drive space. So I generally plan about six months in advance. I know about how much I'm going to shoot, how much I'm going to use for the podcast, and know that if I'm down to only 500 gig free, I need to start planning for that because I don't want to run out and I don't want to have to buy a whole bunch of drives all at once. So that post is all out there in our, in our forum. So go out there and check that out if you have not already. Um, next week, Mark Johnson is back to do a live edit of his composites. Remember, he was back. He was a while back and did cinema, cinematography. I think the the photos that look like they move. Remember that, Tim? Say it again. Cinematography is that where he has oh, yeah, the yeah, image yeah, yeah, and there's yeah, only yeah. Like one yeah. item in the image that's yes, moving. Yes, yes. Yeah. So he's coming back next week, and he's going to remember his composites were just absolutely amazing. He's going to do a live edit. I'm sure he can't take us from the beginning to the end because that takes hours. But he's going to do a live edit of, of how he does his composites next week. Well, that, that was really good. And I, that was something I wanted to do, and I just never really found the right image. And, and then I probably forgot all about it to top it well, off. You know, we learned so many great things as part of why we do the show. Like tonight, with I learned so many things about trains I didn't even know. And train photography from Gene, that um, I got to get out there and do it. And what really kicks me in the butt is that he does it right in my backyard. <laughs> There's really not much excuse not to go do it. <laughs> I can't say it's in some far distant land of a mile away from me. Far distant land, a mile away. <laughs> Literally, the one of the uh, to train thing. I think it's maybe two miles away. Gene, I live um, about a mile from Swanee Town Center. Oh, okay. So not too far at all from that spot where you were at. Uh, and so everybody out in chat, uh, Stephen and Lauren and uh, Carson, um, who I know Stephen, he used to be a longtime uh, listener, and he's, he's missed a few shows late, lately, but we're glad to have you back tonight. Thank you for coming. And our, our two new people, Lauren and Carson, I do not remember. If you've been before, I, I apologize, but I don't remember you coming. So thank you for coming tonight. And if you missed the part of the show, it is recorded. It'll be out on iTunes and all the other locations 
uh, within a few days. So be looking for it there. And until next week, keep it raw. Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. All right.